From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Welcome to Hollywood, Mr. Dollar. This is Daryl. Daryl? Uh, Jim Daryl. Daryl and Clark Insurance. We wrote up the palm quiz policy. Oh, that Daryl. For a minute, I thought maybe... Yeah, yeah, everyone does. Uh, about the policy. Understand you're worried about it. National Underwriters is. They asked me to take a look. Come on over and help yourself. It's a simple enough policy. $100,000 coverage on both Dr. Carl Palmquist and his wife. It's that double indemnity clause I'm interested in. Becomes effective the end of this week, doesn't it? That's right. Why? What's wrong? An anonymous letter sent to underwriters. Kind of hints that somebody's going to try to collect. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to National Underwriters Association, 1180 River Road, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the long shot matter. Expense account item one, $174.90. Airfare and incidentals to Hollywood, California. A good night's sleep at the Beverly Hilton Hotel and in the morning sunshine, Hartford's slush was only a clammy memory. Nobody walks in California, so when in Rome, item two, two dollars even. Cab fare to Daryl and Clark Insurance Brokers. Beverly Hills, where else? Come on in, Dollar. Won't be a minute. Grab a chair. One look at the furnishings and you knew a lot of insurance was sold here. It takes a flock of premiums to pay for the really good modern, the long, clean, functional stuff. Impressive. Jim Darrell was even more so, and I'd have bet that 90% of his policyholders were women. He seemed to be doing two things at once, shaving and keeping track of passers-by in the street outside. I watched him glance quickly out the window for the fifth time, smile happily, then make a check mark on a desk pad. Ah, huh. I give up. What is it? Uh, electric shaver. I mean the bit outside the window. Oh, it's uh, this year's version of counting license plates. You playing alone? Uh-uh. With Clark, my partner. You see, he takes charcoal gray suits and I take Bermuda shorts. Based on strictly how many pass the window. The other side of the street doesn't count. Loser buys lunch. Where's Clark? Seeing a prospect. We play on the honor system. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Darrell. Uh, there, that's better. Yeah. Uh, palm quiz policy, huh? You uh, want to know about it. Well, you sound reluctant. It's delicate. So is this letter. Look into Palmquist policy. You may have to pay off soon. Nice corny touch there. Letters from a magazine pasted on to form the message. Well, the style's a little old hat, but the meaning's clear enough. You want to fill me in? The Palmquist, Mr. Dollar? The last of one of our oldest families out here. Name, social position, money. They've got it all. That's why I'm not too impressed with this little, uh... Communicate. You were telling me about the family. Palmquist, the doctor, an important one. Six dish to the manner born. Complete with iron gray hair and distinguished bearing. A uh, knows what he wants type of man. Has a tremendous practice and still finds time to go hunting about two months out of every year. And his wife? Invalid. Confined to the house. A huge house, by the way, out near the beach. And there's a son, Eric, 25, who lives with him. That's the family. About the policy, Darrell. Simple enough. 100,000 straight coverage on both Dr. Palmquist and his wife. And the beneficiaries? Only one, the son, Eric. For both? For both. Hmm. That's a pretty pointed grunt. Why not? I was thinking of the double indemnity clause that'll be effective in a few days. That's what I thought you were thinking. Well, let me have a couple of addresses, will you? The house at the beach in Palmquist's office. Sure. The uh, office is only a few blocks from here. And, uh, Dollar, please be tactful, will you? Those premiums, they're so lovely. Well, the way to make sure they keep coming is to keep people healthy. Yeah, I guess you have some... Hey, what do you know? Another one. What? Uh, Bermuda shorts. Oh. That puts me three up. Clark's going to scream like an eagle when he pays that lunch check. Today we eat at Romanoff's. I walked the four or five blocks to Dr. Carl Palmquist's office. It was easy to find. You just look for the most expensive building in the most expensive part of Beverly Hills, or as the natives sometimes call it, Lootville. As I turned into the entrance, a young executive type brushed past me on the street. Suit? Charcoal gray. I hoped he wouldn't pass Daryl's window. Dr. Palmquist's office was all it should be. Tasteful, quietly lush, the kind of place that made you wonder why he didn't live right there. The nurse who came forward did nothing to destroy the thought. Blonde, complete with doe eyes, retrousse nose, and a figure that floated. Great medicine for the sick. May I help you? 
I'd like to see the doctor. You have an appointment, Mr. Dollar, Johnny Dollar. No, I haven't. Dr. Palmquist isn't in right now. Well, what time will he be back? Well, he has a 4.30 appointment. Suppose I show at 5, then, Miss... Lund. Steffi Lund. Miss Lund. 5? I can't promise anything, but you might try. Oh, I will. I'll try like mad. Expense account item three, $38 even. Deposit and first day's rental on a drive-it-yourself car. And driving it out along Sunset Boulevard was delightful. I had no trouble at all getting into the California spirit. I pretended that I was a movie producer going home to his starlet wife. I found the Palmquist house on a quiet dead-end street high on the Palisades overlooking the Pacific. Daryl was right. It was huge, a single-story farmhouse that seemed to ramble endlessly. It was a long way to come for nothing. I walked around the side of the house. Nobody tried to stop me. I moved through an open breezeway and wished that somebody had, because suddenly I felt like an intruder, because of the woman sitting in the wheelchair, staring vacantly down at the swimming pool that sparkled in the sunlight, because of the way she poured a drink from the bottle beside her without ever looking at it, because of the way she held the glass as though she wanted you to believe it was sarsaparilla tea, not whiskey. It isn't really medicine, you know. I only pretend that it is. Yeah, sure. Look, I, I didn't mean to barge in like this. Uh, Mrs. Palmquist? Victor says it's disgusting. Calls it a sign of weakness. Do you feel that way, young man? Well, uh, <clears throat> nobody does anything without a reason... Um, my name is Dollar, Mrs. Palmquist, and, well, I'd, I'd like to talk to you for a little while, if, if you feel up to it. Weakness. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's... Very sorry. Victor wouldn't like that either. Would you mind wheeling me into the house, young man? I'm very tired. Oh, yeah, sure thing. You just relax. She leaned back in the chair and closed her eyes. She wasn't sleeping, just somewhere off in thoughts of her own. I pushed the chair toward the house as gently as I could. It wasn't until we almost reached it that I realized we had an audience, a good-looking kid in his mid-twenties watching us from a bedroom window. A kid who didn't want to be seen the way he jumped back from the window told me that. It was getting pretty weird out. Inside the house, I wheeled Mrs. Palmquist into a large living room. Gently, patiently, I tried to get her to answer a few questions, but I got nowhere. She wasn't rude, just secretive, smiling, and very far away. I was wondering how to get out gracefully when... I'm so very sorry. I'm afraid I haven't been very attentive, have I, Mr. Dollar? Suddenly, just as clear and lucid as that. I looked around to see what had made this almost magical change, and he was standing just inside the room, the kid I'd seen watching from the window. Eric, come here, dear. This is my son, Eric. I'm afraid I've forgotten where you told me you were from, Mr. Dollar. I... My mother's been ill, Mr. Dollar. She's not supposed to be disturbed. Oh, now, here... Oh, I am sorry. I was just leaving. Good. I'll show you the way out. Oh. Maybe that would be best. You'll come back again, Mr. Dollar, when I'm feeling better. Yeah, sure, of course. Please make it soon. I don't seem to keep... Very good track of time. Another sign of weakness, I suppose. Well, I... Uh... When you show Mr. Dollar out, please come back, Paul. Oh, yes, Mother. You're a good son, Paul. Uh, this way, Mr. Dollar. What do you want here? You can see she isn't well. Yeah, yeah. It didn't take you long to go from Eric to Paul, did it? She is not insane. You hear, Mr. Dollar? I didn't say she was. Now, why did she call you Paul? Paul was my older brother. He died three years ago. That's part of why she's like she is. A small part. Oh, I'm sorry. Nobody's asking you to be. Just don't come back here. <laughs> 
I had plenty of time to kill before five o'clock, and a lot of things would have been pleasant. Sopping up the Malibu sun, watching the kids on the beach, you name it. But instead, I settled for a visit with an old friend, Lieutenant Barry, homicide. I wasn't just being social. Pretty sneaky, as a matter of fact. The anonymous note which underwriters had received intrigued Barry, and he promised to have it gone over by the police lab. At five on the dot, I was back in Dr. Palmquist's office. Hi. You're a punctual sort of patient, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I used to get gold stars for it at school. Well, I'm afraid Dr. Palmquist doesn't get one. He called just a little while after you left this morning. Oh? He said to cancel all appointments for today that he wouldn't be in. I'm so sorry. Yeah, so am I. I would have called you, but I didn't know where to reach you. Oh, sure, that's okay. What about tomorrow? I can give you an appointment at 10. How's that? I'll be here. Thanks. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar, would you like to give me some information now? Like what? Medical history, previous illnesses, complaints, the usual thing. Saves time in the morning. Well, why don't we wait till tomorrow, in case Dr. Palmquist decides to play hooky again? There's one nice thing about this job. You get around so much you learn to pick up local habits without even thinking about it. For instance, that evening, I had a leisurely dinner, then took in an endless double feature, all without ever once getting out of my car. Drive in, you know. It was well after midnight when I got back to my hotel, feeling a kinship for bus drivers everywhere. I headed across the lobby, ran smack into Jim Darrell as I rounded the cigar stand. Whoa! Oh, dollar, where have you been? Well, hi, Darrell. Hey, who wound up paying for lunch? Listen, I've been trying to get hold of you all night. Where were you? Dinner, a movie, the wildlife, huh? Well, don't look that unhappy. I didn't do anything illegal. Somebody did. What? Hey, what is it, Daryl? What are you talking about? Mrs. Palmquist. Dead. Shot to death. A couple of hours ago. Johnny Dollar. Johnny, Lieutenant Barry, homicide. Got messages from you three inches thick. Yeah, I've been trying to get hold of you all morning. Well, that hasn't exactly been a social tea around here, you know. What with the murder of Dr. Palmquist's wife. Can I come down there to headquarters? Come ahead, and if you're a good boy, I'll introduce you to the man who did the killing. What? Of course, he denies it completely. Who wouldn't? But will you hear his story? It's a wild one. Hold it. You're way ahead of me. You're saying you've got the killer there? That's what I'm saying. Well... Who is he? You wouldn't know him. Nobody seems to. Make a little sense, will you, Lieutenant? Look, you coming down or not? Right now. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California, to National Underwriters Association, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the long shot matter. Los Angeles traffic being what it is, there was plenty of time to think on the way to Barry's office. But think about what? An unsigned warning that someone was going to collect on a $100,000 policy? A frail, defeated woman who wasn't going to have to worry about weakness anymore. There was an awful lot to find out before this whole thing could begin to make sense. That was pretty obvious. The man I was going to see was anything but obvious. Big and round, he was like a fat cubie doll with a gun. You always had the feeling his round little eyes were dreaming past you, seeing an island where there was no jail cells. A lot of cons had made that mistake, found out too late that Barry was as sharp as any homicide cop alive. Life is like that, huh, Johnny? Yesterday your visit was social, today it's business. Yeah, just one dead woman can make a lot of difference. Sit down. Like I said, I'm way behind you. How did it happen? When? Sit down. I can't talk when you're standing. Okay. Santa Monica substation got the call about nine last night from Dr. Palmquist. He was real excited, said he was holding a rifle on a prowler who'd come in and shot and killed his wife. So we got out there fast. Wait a minute. Did the doctor know? <laughs> Let me tell it my way, huh? Okay. We found Mrs. Palmquist dead on the living room floor, and the doctor's still holding this guy at rifle point. Thirty-eight Colt lay in a corner with nobody paying much attention to it. Ballistic says it's the murder weapon, all right. What's the doctor's story? Says he was out on a house call, got home a couple of minutes before nine. On the way to the front door, he glanced through the living room window, saw this prowler holding a gun on Mrs. Palmquist. The doctor got into the house quietly and was sneaking up from behind when the prowler heard him and got rattled. The prowler fired and killed the woman just as the doc brought a paperweight down on his head. Nice, huh? A little out of left field. 
Funny, I always thought prowlers and gunmen are two different things. Nothing says it can't happen, and the evidence says it did. Well, what does that mean? That this is one prowler who's sewn up tight, because everything checks out. The thirty-eight is his, his prints are on it. Lab found the lock he forced to get in. What else you want, a moving picture? Well, don't get mad, don't get mad. I'm just asking. Now, that house call the doctor was out on, I'm a stranger in town, but isn't that kind of a late hour to see a patient, unless it's a real emergency? Not when they look like this one. Oh? I checked with her this morning. She could make me go to medical school right now, even at this age. Nice, huh? Put it this way. Her first name ought to be Marilyn. Well, that's pretty clear. Who is she? A Mrs. Laura Considine. 35, widow, money, and everyone should look like that. She been Dr. Palmquist's patient long? Three or four years. And she backs up the story of the house call completely. You sold? I want to know about the prowler. Who is he? Ex-con, drifter, 57 years old. Got a record that goes way back. What kind of record? I was afraid you'd ask, because that's the fly in the ointment. It's a long sheet and it's buried. Bunko, con game, badger, bad checks, pigeon drop, all small stuff. But not an ounce of violence anywhere. A killing's way out of pattern, isn't it? Yeah. This prowler, what does he claim? It's so wild I'm embarrassed to repeat it. How's chances of my seeing him? Maybe he'll tell me. Barry took me upstairs to what they call the hotshot section. A very exclusive floor, this one, because the cells hold only prisoners suspected of the big rap, murder. And you know something? I never heard a place like this, but what an old fallacy comes bouncing back into my mind. That bit about being able to tell a man's character by looking at him. What does a murderer look like? <laughs> Go ahead, put yourself out on that limb, but don't drag me out there with you. Because the man sitting quietly in cell 8A looked about as hard and dangerous as a Victorian antimacassar. Lonnie Miller, prowler and murder suspect. Lonnie Miller, gray-haired, tall and slim, a man with good straight bearing even while he sat. Yet, with a delicacy about him. Or maybe it was just the natural good manners of the born con man. I didn't know. Yell when you want out, Johnny. Yeah. I'm not going to change the story. I'll tell it again, but it'll be the same. Is that what you want, officer? I'm not the police, Miller. My name is Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. It's a little late for me to buy insurance, isn't it? Miller, you don't have to talk to me if you don't want to, but you'd be helping yourself if you told me the truth. They didn't believe me. Not one word. Why would you? My jobs are different. My interest is in the insurance angle. Did you kill Mrs. Palmquist? I'm nearly 60, mister, and I've done everything in the book, almost everything. But I never killed. Never. I can't make them see that. Yeah, I know. Told them a hundred times, word for word, step by step. They just sit and look at me. Well, what do I have to do to make them believe I didn't do it? From what I hear, they've got an awful lot of evidence that says you did. You too, huh? Go away, mister. You may be a little different kind of cop, but you're talking like all the others. You're thinking like them. Let me alone. You haven't got much chance, Miller, if that's your only answer to evidence. Evidence? I know all about that stuff. You can buy it and sell it, manufacture it, make it stand up and do tricks. The cops... Miller, you're any... talking through your hat. You've been the route. Do you know one case where the police ever manufactured evidence? And I don't mean con talk. I mean one you actually know of. Oh, what's the difference? Look, why don't you tell me about it? Think you could listen without sneering? Nobody else can. Try me, huh? Now, how did you get into this? I just finished doing time in San Diego. Been hitchhiking my way up from there. Four nights ago, a truck let me off on the Pacific Coast Highway about 15 miles south of L.A. A few minutes later, a man in a big cab gave me a lift. Nice enough fella. A little nosy about where I was from, where I was going, things like that. But, but nice. Yeah, go on. After about five minutes, he decided we needed coffee. So we stopped at a little tacos joint. Ten minutes later, we were back on the road. After about two miles, he said it felt like we had a flat. So we stopped. It was a flat, all right, left rear. So? Well, he had given me the lift. The least I could do was to change his tire, so I did it. He was real friendly the rest of the way. He told me to stick around town and he'd see I got a job. He gave me a 20 told me where to get a room and said to wait for him to phone. He said his name was Carter. You do what he said? Last night he called me. 
said to be at his house at nine sharp to meet a man who had a job for me, an address in the Palisades. Well, go on. The house was dark when I got there, so I rang the bell. Someone opened the door. I took one step inside and got hit on the head. Next thing I know, I'm coming to on the living room floor. There's a dead woman a few feet away, and my friend Carter is holding a rifle at my head, threatening to blow it off if I move. Only when the cops got there, they didn't call him Carter, but Dr. Palmquist. Palmquist? Miller, do you realize what you're saying? I know. And every word of it's the truth. Now tell me this, mister. How do I get anyone to believe it? Miller sat there quietly looking first at his burning cigarette, then at me. It was as though he didn't expect either one of us to believe him. I was glad to get out of there. Well, I'll say this much for Miller, Johnny. He's got that story down pat. He didn't tell you one word that he hasn't been telling us. Lieutenant, does Dr. Palmquist know what Miller claims? We haven't discussed it. Didn't I tell you the doctor's resting at Blair Hospital for a day or so, shock of his wife's death? Do you intend to tell him? Look... I know you're a fellow who automatically roots for the underdog, but face it, boy, what have I got? An ex-con with a wild story against a respected citizen with a perfect alibi. I'd look kind of silly questioning Palmquist at the moment. At the moment? Does that mean you've got doubts about Palmquist? I doubt everybody till the last page, boy. That's how I got to be lieutenant. And that's where we left it. I had a long, thoughtful lunch, which included two very dry martinis aimed at helping solve a new problem. To which, how best to arrange a few words with a hospitalized Dr. Palmquist at such a delicate time. In the end, I did the only thing I could, walked into room 913 at Blair Hospital and introduced myself. Dr. Palmquist didn't seem at all surprised by the visit. He seemed annoyed, if anything, but the annoyance was with himself. I'm not a very good advertisement for my own profession at the moment, am I, Mr. Dollar? I, uh, I'm sorry to intrude, Doctor. I probably could have picked a better time for a visit. You've been doing your best... What? Which do you prefer, Mr. Dollar, my office or my home? Would you like the names of a few friends? Perhaps they can tell you whatever it is you're trying to find out about me. It's my job, Doctor. And just what is your job, Mr. Dollar? Insurance investigator for the company that holds the policy on Mrs. Palmquist and yourself. I see. Then you can stop running around now, can't you? You can simply go to the police and they'll tell you anything you want to know. <sighs> Doctor, may Mr. I... Mr. Dollar, I don't usually prescribe without a thorough examination, but... Please do. Very well. I don't think California is your cup of tea. I suggest another climate entirely. The visit was over. Palmquist lay back against the pillows, no longer interested, and I turned to leave. Just as I was reaching for the door, it opened, and one of the most beautiful women I'd ever seen started into the room. I think you have the wrong room, madam. For a moment, she just stood there, startled. Then, without a word, she turned and hurried out. But not before I'd gotten a good look at the large block initials on the purse she carried, L.C. The two letters plus the way she looked made Laura Considine a pretty good bet. Nice twist, huh? The doctor is ill and the patient comes to call. You can't trust anybody these days, can you? Johnny Deller. Lieutenant Barry here. Oh, hi, Lieutenant. You're stepping on toes, Johnny boy. Who's now? Dr. Victor Palmquist. Here you had a chat with him. Just how do you chat with a clan? Whatever it was, he was very unhappy about it. He called you? Yeah, very snide, too. Said if we had any more questions, to leave him alone and call his lawyers and to keep unauthorized people away from him. Meaning me? Meaning you. Well, what's he worried about? You've already got his wife's killer in jail, haven't you? Everybody buys that but you, Johnny. You said it before. I'm a hard sale. Meet me for lunch. I'll try to sell you. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California... To National Underwriters Association, 1180 River Road, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the long shot matter. Expense account continued. 
Item three, one dollar even. Taxi to the Barclay for lunch with Lieutenant Barry. But let me backtrack for a minute. Coming down in the hotel elevator, I kept thinking over what the lieutenant had said, and I disagreed completely. I wasn't a hard sale. It's just that I wasn't an early sale. There were too many angles to the death of Mrs. Palmquist, too many things I didn't know yet. I got proof of that the minute I stepped outside the hotel. The white cad sedan parked directly across the street contained a real interesting combination of people. Eric Palmquist, the doctor's son, and Steffi Lund, the doctor's nurse. The moment they saw me, they did what every amateur sleuth does. They drove away as fast as possible, thereby becoming just as conspicuous as a second nose. By the time I reached the Barclay, Lieutenant Berry had ordered for both of us. You don't like it, order something else, but it's the best they got. Matter of fact, it looks pretty good. Now, as I was saying... Yeah, yeah, so Palmquist, nurse, and his kid are an item. You waiting for me to look impressed? You get up out of the wrong side this morning, Lieutenant. Look, I don't like the smell of this deal any more than you do, but what does it all add up to? You're sent out here to look into a possible killing. Which happens? Victim, Mrs. Palmquist. So an ex-convict sits in a cell accused of the murder. The accuser and witness, the dead woman's husband. The con insists he's been framed, that the husband is a killer. But the husband is well alibied, bringing it down to the setup known as ex-con versus respected citizen. You know there's more to it than that. Don't give me lessons, Johnny. You think you've come up with one thing we don't already know about? I got checkouts going on the doctor, his nurse, his son, everybody within shooting distance of this thing. Don't get any ideas we're asleep down at the hall. All right, all right. Give me a little fill, huh? Who? Palmquist's nurse, Steffi Lund. Nice kid, never been in trouble. At least we couldn't find any. What about the boy, Eric Palmquist? Typical rich doctor's son. Kind of wild, sensitive, gambles, but Papa can afford it. Also hits the booze too much for a kid that young. What about the doctor's alibi, Laura Considine? Yeah, no, I should have skipped that one. Your eyes look like they're whistling. Isn't that awful? At my age, too. <clears throat> All right, Johnny, she's clean. By the way, where does she live? There's a big house in Long Beach. Why? No doctors there? Still a free country. I know people whose doctors live in Patterson, New Jersey. Points. Oh, almost forgot. I got the lab report on that anonymous note that started this thing. Anything? Untraceable. No prints, cheap paper that can be bought anywhere. And the letters were cut from a dozen different magazines. Didn't tell us a thing. What do you mean it didn't? What? It told us someone was going to try to collect on a policy. We knocked it around a little while longer, getting no place in particular. Then suddenly I was being paged for a telephone call. Barry's raised eyebrows were eloquent. They made me feel like one of those would-be movie stars who have themselves paged in the brown derby so that other would-be stars will know they're there. I had a funny notion about who might be calling, so I told the waiter I'd taken in the booth out front and left Lieutenant Barry by himself. Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, I'm so glad I found you. Oh? This is this is Steffi Lund, Dr. Palmquist's nurse. Well, the day's picking up. I'm sorry. I hope I didn't interrupt your lunch. You see, I called your hotel and they told me where you'd gone. I'm sorry. Well, I don't didn't... apologize, Steffi. A working girl who drives around in a beautiful white Cadillac doesn't have to, you know. I, I'll explain about that. Why should you owe me any explanation? Please, Mr. Dollar. I've got to see you right away. It's terribly important. Mr. Dollar. Where are you? I'm at Dr. Palmquist's office. Can you come here now, right away? Okay, I'll be right over. And please, don't bring anyone along with you, will you? However you want it, you're calling the shots. Oh, thank you. And hurry, please. <laughs> Expense account item four. Citation for speeding, $25. The carbon copy reads 63 miles per hour in a 35 zone. You ever try to talk an L.A.-type cop out of a ticket? It's ridiculous. He's always a big, good-looking guy who listens seriously while you alibi, but never stops writing. Then he smiles, calls you sir, and hands you the ticket. I couldn't beef about it, though. Two reasons. One, I deserved it. And two, if I hadn't been stopped, I'd never have realized I was being tailed. Because the tail knew what he was doing. A heavy-set, thuggy-looking fellow in a black 51 sedan. He circled the block twice while I was getting the ticket. It was right back on me as I started out again. He was still there as I pulled up in front of Dr. Palmquist's office. But he was smart enough to ride on by without even looking at me. I waited to see if he'd come around the block again. He didn't.
Yes, sir. What is it? Why? What do you want? Well, now, that's a switch. When you called me a few minutes ago, you no, said... No, you're mistaken. I, I didn't well, call now, you. Well, wait just a I minute. I didn't call you. Don't her you Her words were deliberate, emphatic, you. but her eyes were suddenly doing the real talking, signaling desperately into the room behind her, trying to tell me that she wasn't alone. But I wasn't the only one who caught the signal. Get away from the door, Stevie. Come in, you. Did you hear me? I said come in. Eric, please. Hello, Eric. What seems to be the trouble around here? That's far enough. Oh, now, come on. Why don't you put that thing down? Your family's had enough misery with 38s. He's dying. Do what he says. Why did you call him, Steffi? Why? Because somebody's got to help you because of what you're going through and what it's doing to you. Eric, I can't stand any more of it. You're half out of your mind with fear now. Listen to him, Eric. Maybe he can you help. You think he can help? You think anybody can? One thing's sure. That gun's not going to help you any... Come on now, kid, put it down. No. No, because nobody tells me what to do. Not when I've got a gun. They're afraid to. <laughs> That's right. They're afraid to. You're both afraid, aren't you? <laughs> it's nice. It's nice for somebody else to be afraid. I like that. I, I really like that. <laughs> he wasn't even looking at us anymore just somewhere off into space somehow Steffi sensed that I was waiting for a chance to grab his gun and motion for me not to and suddenly I remembered where I'd seen that lost empty look before Mrs. Palmquist, Eric's mother she'd had her share of that look the day she died <laughs> Mr. Dollar help me with him, please I picked him up, put him on the couch he had that terrible whiteness that a deep faint brings, and Steffi didn't waste any time. She loosened his collar, shoved his head forward. In a few minutes, he shut it once, came to, took a deep breath. We made him comfortable on the couch, but you could see that it had been a rough trip for him. He was conscious, but he didn't have the strength to open his eyes. Steffi just stared at him. You'll be all right now. What's wrong with him, Steffi? Why that, that thing that just happened? You want the technical name? Circulatory liability. Sound impressive. Talk layman, huh? A form of extreme hypertension. Nerves. Enough to make him faint like that from anger, from fear. It's a lovely thing for a man to go through, isn't it? Well, that, that calls for a different kind of medicine, doesn't it? Analysis with a psychiatrist. He's in it now. Only with Eric, it's going to take a long time. Maybe a very long time. But a kid like that, how? Why? Fear. Overpowering, petrifying fear. Of what? His father. Of Dr. Palmquist? Yes. The nice Dr. Palmquist. The gentle, quiet healer. My employer. My father-in-law. You and Eric are married? Tijuana, six weeks ago. Eric is 25 years old, Mr. Dollar, and he's so afraid of his father we're still keeping the marriage a secret. Why, Steffi? Why is he so afraid of Palmquist? His analyst hasn't been able to get through to that. You expect me to? Well, somebody better. Why did you say that? Because he waved that gun around very convincingly for a scared kid. He never would have fired. Don't you understand? He's so frightened he couldn't have made himself do it. I hope you're right. I didn't think it was quite the time to mention one small fact. That if Eric Palmquist was incapable of pulling a trigger, it might turn out to be a very good thing for him. As the sole beneficiary of his mother's will, he would soon have $100,000 in a nice, tidy lump. And if he really was afraid of his father, a piece of money like that could take him a long, long way from the parental fold. In fact, no matter which way you turned, you couldn't get away from the logic that Eric Palmquist might be regarded by some parties as a first-class suspect in the death of his mother. Steffi was still pretty much upset when I finally left her, and I must admit that my own mind wasn't exactly at ease. Hoping that the fresh air would help to clear my thoughts, I took my time driving back, and it must have been nearly an hour later when I pulled into the subterranean garage of my hotel. I guess I was thinking too hard about what had just happened. In any case, I wasn't quick enough. Just as I passed one of the garage's big concrete pillars, a figure stepped out from behind it, brought the business end of a coat banging down on my head. The ground climbed up and got me. But not before I had a look at him. 
my heavy-set, thuggy-looking friend who tailed me earlier in the day. He could talk, too. You're in the wrong town, punk. Take the hint. I took the hint. I passed out. Johnny Dollar. Oh, this is Dr. Van Clauser returning your call, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes, doctor. Uh, may I ask who recommended me? I inquired about a good psychiatrist, and it came up you. Oh, yes, sir. Well, the first step is usually an office appointment for a preliminary check. That's what I had in mind. Today? Oh, my schedule is quite full. Would tomorrow be suitable? Today would be better. Oh, I see. But there should be ample time. There for... should be ample time, but there isn't. In fact, I'm running out of it fast. Very well. Eleven o'clock. Dust off your couch. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California... To National Underwriters Association, 1180 River Road, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the long shot matter. Johnny Dollar, hypochondriac, complete with assorted medical advisors. I needed one of them before I even got down to the lobby of my hotel. It was the house medic, that's item five, five dollars, who'd patched me up yesterday after a thug had worked me over in the hotel garage. Now came checkup time, and the doctor was a fusser, and he disapproved of me. Hold still now, hold still. Yeah, yeah, but that's my head you're digging in. I wouldn't have to if somebody else hadn't split it open. Oh. There. Hey. Well, it looks a little better. Yeah, well, don't sound so enthusiastic. Walking into a wall. It's the best <laughs> I could think of at the moment. Likely story. Hold still now. I want to redress that wound on the other side. Hold still. Temper, temper. Funny. He was working on the outside of my head, but it was the inside that ached most. There were reasons, lots of them. Like the murder of a sick old woman the same day I'd arrived, and the anonymous note that had warned of it. Like the victim's husband and an ex-convict accusing each other of committing the crime. It was a rough one, real rough, because the picture kept changing from minute to minute, and my company was on the hook for $100,000. <laughs> At 11 o'clock, I sat across the desk from Dr. Hans van Clauser, psychiatrist in his Beverly Hills office. He was small, spectacled, and charmingly Viennese. More important, he was the analyst who was treating Eric Palmquist, the murdered woman's son. Uh, now, Mr. Dollar? Afraid I owe you an apology, doctor. I deceived you a little bit. I'm not exactly here as a patient. Oh, everyone finds it difficult to begin, Mr. Dollar. Uh... You suppose we hear some of the medical history first? Huh? I tell you, we're off on the wrong foot, Doctor, and it's my fault. Here, take a look at these, my credentials. I, I see Then you're hardly here as a patient. About a patient, let's say. My dear Mr. Dollar, I think you know very well that I can reveal nothing which is told to me in this room. I know that. Then the purpose of this visit? I just want answers from a competent authority about a certain illness. I won't bring personalities into it. It's important, Doctor. And the particular illness? Something called circulatory lability. Uh, you know that it's a form of extremely provoked hypertension? Yeah, that much I do. Hypertension is the result of anxieties. The anxieties may be real or fancied, but the hypertension is very genuine indeed and very dangerous. Dangerous to the extent that a man could turn to violence, maybe kill? If sufficiently aroused, Yes, it has happened. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Item seven, ten cents. Recklessly squandered on a phone call to my hotel to check for messages. There was one. Lieutenant Berry of the L.A. Police Department would like to see me at my convenience. Would I? I would. You get practically nowhere ignoring police lieutenants. He stared at the bandage on my head and my assorted cuts and bruises, and his opening line was quite inspired. Oh, what happened to you? Somebody was pretty fast with a gun barrel last night. Where did it happen? Garage, under my hotel. It seems he didn't like my being in town. You got a look at him? Enough. Want to go through the mug book? Uh, no, I'll catch up with him someday. Besides, whoever was paying him is the interesting one. Have it your own way. 
Well, now, you didn't call me all the way down here for laughs, Lieutenant. Anything special on your mind? Lonnie Miller, the guy we got sitting in cell number 8A, the prowler who shot Mrs. Palmquist. So Dr. Palmquist insists. He isn't the only one, Johnny, not anymore. What? Yeah. We finally traced the murder weapon. It was bought at a pawn shop in Burbank. The pawnbroker positively identified a mugshot of the buyer, Lonnie Miller. Police identification evidence is a pretty tough thing to ignore. But I was still what the lieutenant called a hard sale. It wasn't stubbornness, simply the fact that I'm very large for motivation. It can be as wild, as woolly as they come, but it's got to be there somewhere. And somehow, with so many good ones around, the worn, faded man in cell 8A didn't raid in that company. I asked the lieutenant for a couple of minutes with Lonnie Miller. He shook his head as though he felt sorry for me, but okayed the visit anyway. Miller? You're angry about something, Mr. Dollar. I can tell it's in your face. Yeah. About a story you told me the other day. About Dr. Palmquist giving you a lift, keeping you around town, then using you as a patsy so he could kill his wife. You want to change any of it? You asking if I lied, mister? Is that it? That's it. It's figured to be like this sooner or later. Goodbye, mister. Come on, Miller. Talk to me. Lie? I think I'd lie to the only man who even looked like he believed me. You still have an answer. Mr. Mr., don't you think I know I haven't got a chance? That I'm dead? I don't even care anymore. But I didn't lie. Not one word. A Burbank pawnbroker says you did. Says you bought the murder gun from him. I, I've never even been in Burbank, I swear to you. How could I have bought the gun? He identified a picture of you. Says you showed your driver's license as identification. Where is your license, Miller? In my wallet, downstairs. They took everything when they booked me. Mr. Dollar? Tell it to me all over again, Miller, from the minute Dr. Palmquist gave you the lift, step by step, every single detail. Tell it to me. He began slowly, haltingly. The words just kind of fell out of his mouth in a tired, hopeless fashion. It was the same story he told so many times now. I had reason for making him go through it. Some small, hazy idea that was tugging at the back of my brain, jagged, undeveloped, but an idea. When I left the cell, I had Miller's permission to look in his wallet. The police custodian showed it to me five minutes after that. The license wasn't there. Expense account item eight, ten cents, an L.A. newspaper, three days old. One which played up the Palmquist killing big contained pictures of both Dr. Palmquist, grieving husband, and Lonnie Miller, suspected killer. Purpose? To be used in backtracking. The drive down to Long Beach could have been pleasant. Sun, ocean, a relaxing type day, but not for me. Not with what was going on inside my head. Even the soft breeze coming in off the Pacific couldn't sweep the pieces together for me. Sure, for a few seconds, everything would make sense... Then, a moment later, some small fact would make the whole theory collapse. I knew one thing, though. If this whole deal was a frame, it was a great one, a work of art, something to be admired, provided your name was neither Lonnie Miller or National Underwriters. About six miles this side of Long Beach, I found what I was looking for, the little tacos joint where Miller claimed he and Dr. Palmquist had stopped for coffee. Amigo, you, you like some tacos? Sure. Uh, sit down. It won't be a minute. Owner around? <laughs> You're looking at him, amigo. Irving Gonzalez, owner. Irving? Sure. I, I had it changed. Nobody could pronounce Plutarco Gonzalez. <laughs> uh, see your point. <laughs> he doesn't pay to make problems for your customers in business. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when are you going to work up to asking the questions, amigo? What? <laughs> I can make tacos blindfolded, and I can tell a cop the same way. Well, you're not too far wrong. Want to take a look at this newspaper? Either of these men ever been in here? And Dr. Victor Palmquist and Lonnie Miller. Oh, I read about that killing. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, what about it, Irving? What about what? These men. Have they ever been in here, alone, together, any time? Yes, I mean... They... Look kind of familiar, but 
Maybe it's only because I see him in the papers. Do you know? Is that the best you can do? Well, well, look, amigo, you stand behind a counter all day and everybody looks like everybody else. But you wouldn't want me to make a guess, and that's all I'd be doing, guessing. No, I wouldn't want that. Here, nice and hot. Eat your tacos, amigo. Thanks anyway. I'll skip them this time. Here. You know something? I don't blame you. Hey, look at this. Pills. Pills? Pills. I eat them by the dozen. Do you know why, amigo? Tacos. There's this about the racket. You try, you strike out, you can't waste time thinking about it. You get on to the next step. The step? Laura Considine, Dr. Palmquist's lovely alibi the night of his wife's death. Her house was only a few miles out of Long Beach. It seemed logical to head for it. I reached it about 20 minutes later, a large, old-fashioned, and seemingly deserted house in a promontory that jutted out into the Pacific. Strike out number two, the hostile iron fence that circled it made its point. Keep out, so I did. Trespassing applies to everyone. From where I stood, I couldn't identify the car that suddenly roared away from the back of the house, but one thing was obvious, the driver was in a hurry, and I was getting nowhere. I decided to head back to town. It happened five minutes later as I rounded a curve on my way back to the Pacific Coast Highway. Choice, the Pacific on one side, granite cliffs on the other. I picked the cliffs. Funny what your mind does at moments like that. I remember looking at the mashed inside of the car and wondering which company carried the insurance policy. Then, I thought of how good a marksman a man must be to pick off a tire from any of those cliffs. And then I remembered still another thing. Hadn't I been told about someone who was a great shot, who made it a rule to hunt two months out of the year, no matter how busy he was? Sure. A highly respected citizen named Dr. Victor Palmquist. Johnny Dollar. This is Laura Considine, Mr. Dollar. You don't know me, but... Oh, but I do, Mrs. Considine. You're the best friend a doctor ever had. Dr. Palmquist, that is. Mr. Dollar, He paid you a professional call the night his wife was murdered. That was lucky. Alibis don't grow on trees. Just a minute, Mr. Dollar. Look, lady, I've been slugged, shot at. Matter of fact, someone tried to pick me off with a rifle a couple of hours ago, right near your house. Maybe Dr. Palmquist will alibi you this time. Return the courtesy. Will you please listen? I've got to see you. I've got to talk to you. All right, when? An hour the bar at your hotel. The martinis will be waiting. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to National Underwriters Association, 1180 River Road, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the long shot matter. Expense account concluded. There were still a lot of questions, like where I was getting, trying to find out who really had killed Mrs. Palmquist. Like, was it all a smoothly planned frame on the part of her doctor husband? Or had it been a prowler killing by another man now in jail? Or had the dead woman's son, Eric, a complex we didn't know about? Mrs. Considine was five minutes late, but I hope she could answer some of them. Mr. Dollar? Oh, come now, Mrs. Considine, that reading. It implied we haven't met before, and you know that we have. Well, I don't remember. The day you visited Dr. Palmquist in the hospital and pretended you had the wrong room. Sit down. Well, there was a reason for that. Sure, there's one for everything. Is there? You think Victor Palmquist had something to do with his wife's death. Well, you're wrong. Completely wrong. Correction. You don't know what I'm thinking, and being wrong is anybody's privilege. You don't know about Victor, Mr. Dollar. What his life's been like, what he had to put up with. Why don't you tell me, Mrs. Considine? That wife of his. A millstone around his neck. A woman in love with a bottle. Go on. And that son of his, that Eric. Insane. Completely insane. He hates his father. He always has. He gains a fortune by that woman's death. But do you suspect him? No, of course not. 
You badger a man like Victor Palmquist. Now, does that make sense? You're building a big thing on the fact that a lot of people hate Victor Palmquist, but you're overlooking something. Mr. Dollar. Where there's that much hate, there's always a good reason. I went to the hotel garage, rented a car, and pointed it toward Burbank. There was a man in a pawn shop there I wanted to see. The man who had identified Lonnie Miller as the buyer of the gun that had killed Mrs. Victor Palmquist. He turned out to be a mild, friendly little guy with thick glasses and a desire to please. He barely glanced at my identification, pushed it back over the counter to me, and smiled. What do you want to know? Everything you can remember about the man who bought the gun, Mr. Lerner. What's to remember? A kind of skinny, gray-haired fella come in, said he wanted to buy a gun. I showed him one. He bought it. He showed you a driver's license for identification, didn't he? I copied the information right here in the book. Uh, right here. Lonnie Miller, 173 Fuller, San Diego, height 6 feet, weight 152, color white. Here, here, look this up. Yeah. Look at this paper, Mr. Lerner. One of these, the fella? Hmm, uh, let me see. Lerner adjusted his glasses and leaned forward to peer at the newspaper I'd put on the counter. It was the way I was leaning on the paper that really started the whole thing. The two pictures were side by side, Dr. Palmquist in a business suit and Lonnie Miller in a cap, leather jacket, and work pants. My arm was covering everything but the faces. Lerner moved my arm before pointing out Miller as the buyer of the gun. Then he nodded emphatically. Sure, that's the fellow who bought the gun, that Miller. You had to move my arm before you'd say so, Mr. Lerner. You were covering up half the picture. What am I, a mind reader? No, but I think you might have made the most normal mistake in the world. Wait, wait. You were trying to tell me this Miller didn't come in here and buy a gun from me? That's about it. So how come a fellow who wasn't here gave me a driver's license and said he was? That's a good question, Mr. Lerner. There were two people I wanted to see now, real bad. Lieutenant Barry at Homicide and Lonnie Miller, Cell 8A, City Jail. I streaked down to headquarters and guess what? The lieutenant was out on police business. Should be back in a while. I knew Lonnie Miller wasn't out, so I settled for him. There were only two or three questions I wanted to ask him, but they were important. I spent about 15 minutes in the cell with Miller, got my answers, and they made sense now. Then I spent an hour waiting for the lieutenant. He finally showed this time, he was the hard sale, even after I discussed what I'd figured out at the pawn shop. Johnny, Johnny, I'm tired. Oh, sure, me too. Now, look, Lieutenant, you know what I'm pushing is possible. Dr. Palmquist and Lonnie Miller are approximately the same size, age, coloring. Even the bone structure is fairly similar. But they don't look alike. They don't have to, because it's the impression that counted here. Johnny! That's exactly what Palmquist was counting on. Now, look, Lieutenant, you've been around... You know what people go by when they're asked to identify someone? An all-over impression. So? And you know a big factor is clothes, particularly the type of clothes. All right, all right. What are you going for? This. If Dr. Palmquist walked into that pawn shop wearing a cap, leather jacket, and work pants, and then, six days later, you show the pawnbroker a picture of Lonnie Miller dressed in the same kind of clothes, you know whom he'll identify every time especially when he'd already seen a driver's license made out to Lonnie Miller. A thousand ways to make a living. What did I pick Lieutenant. This? Look, suppose I buy that. Where are you? Dr. Palmquist, for some reason or other, wants his wife dead. He needs a patsy. So he picks up Lonnie Miller, a hitchhiker on the Pacific Coast Highway. If you say so. At a coffee stop, the doctor remembers something he left in the car. He goes out for a minute, sticks a match or a toothpick in a tire valve, guaranteeing a flat a few miles further on... So when they stop, it's the doctor who looks at the flat, gets rid of the toothpick. Grateful for the lift, Miller changes the tire. You ever change a tire on a hot summer night? Well, sure. You took off your jacket, didn't you? How else? That's what Doc was counting on. He had a couple of minutes alone with Miller's jacket and lifted his driver's license. Then he keeps Miller in town on the promise of a job. He buys the gun at the Burbank pawn shop wearing work clothes and giving Miller's license as identification. Monday night, he killed his wife, called Miller to the house with a phony story about a job, struck him from behind, and staged the scene the police found. Smooth, huh? Johnny, can you see me going to the D.A. with all that theory and no proof? Palmquist had laughed me out of town. Barry, look. Knock it off. You're no kid. You know I'm right. Ah. Well, don't go away mad. Sure, I know he was right. That's what was driving me crazy. Proof. One little piece of it, but where? Oh, Palmquist had used his head all right. But the smartest ones alive always leave one little hole somewhere along the line. 
But three hours later in my hotel room, I hadn't found it. Steffi, what are you doing here? Johnny. Eric's been drinking all day, brooding, working himself into a rage, saying terrible things about Mrs. Considine and his father, and about his father being a murderer. I don't know what he'll do. Help me, Johnny, please. Did he give you any idea of where he was headed? He, he mentioned going home to get a gun and then going to Mrs. Considine's house. Johnny, I'm afraid. All right, come on. The drive to the Palmquist house on the Palisades was a long one, but educational. Because Steffi had nothing to hide now. She was just a kid worried to death about her husband. And her bitterness toward Dr. Palmquist came rolling out. He's an easy man to hate, my father-in-law. All charm on the outside. A petty little dictator inside. A man who's trying to prove something, who can't abide weakness. Who tries to make everyone over into his own image. A horrible man. Tell me about Eric's brother. Paul, he was the favorite, the doctor's pride and joy. They hunted together all the time. Only one day, Paul had a cold, tried to get out of a hunting trip. This offended the doctor's weakness fetish. It made the boy feel like a coward, so Paul went hunting and died of pneumonia. Mrs. Palmquist never got over it, as you saw before she was killed. Nice, Johnny. You like the family I married into? The house was dark when we got there. We hurried to Eric's bedroom, and Steffi leaned against the door, weak with relief. Eric lay sprawled on the bed, snoring fine alcoholic noises. The rifle he still clutched made very clear what he'd been thinking about before the liquor had taken over. We were just getting him comfortable when we heard it. A car pulling into the garage. Palmquist. I got Steffi down the back stairs and out of the house as soon as I was sure he was inside. And then I turned back. Because suddenly I was tired of a killer walking around free while everyone else stepped softly. And the anger was good, because it suddenly drove into my mind the one thing Palmquist might have overlooked. I let myself into the garage with a small window, moved to the doctor's big car. You ever try to force open a car trunk with a claw hammer? Don't. A, it's rough, and B, it takes your eyes off the door leading to the kitchen. Why don't you ask me for the key, Dollar? A gun, doctor? No instrument of healing? Oh, that's nice. And it tells me something about the trunk. That there's a spare tire in there that's flat, but doesn't have a puncture. A service station might remember a thing like that, huh, Doctor? Quite right, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. He couldn't pick me off because of the car. But the car was working against me, too. You did better with a rifle yesterday, Doctor. I'll manage, Mr. <laughs> man my age through windows, no less. He had it? Nah. Nah, he'll look good in court. Small question, Lieutenant. Not that I'm ungrateful. Ask. Aren't you a long way from home? I didn't like the look in your eye when you stomped out. You know something, Johnny? You're easier to tail than a trolley car. <laughs> Expense account, item 12, $71. L.A. hotel bill. Item 13, $174.90. Return airfare to Hartford. Expense account total, $490.80. Details? Eric Palmquist admitted sending us the original warning note out of fear of his father. He never knew till the death of his mother that he himself was the beneficiary. Remarks about Hollywood. Let's call it the Easterner's Revenge. Quote, it's a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. Unquote. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, three million dollars worth of a worthless gold mine. And there's blood on the desert sand. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Your 
Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Tony Barrett, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Victor Perrin, Lillian Baeff, Russell Thorson, James McCallion, Edgar Barrier, Don Diamond, and Herb Butterfield. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino and Carl Fortina. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. (laughs) 